What if Ash Ketchum woke up on time on the day he picked his starter? What if, instead of smashing his alarm clock and sleeping in, Ash got out of bed early? What if he'd started his journey with Squirtle instead of Pikachu? These are the questions I've been exploring over the first three videos in this series where we've seen him travel from Kanto to Johto to Hoenn. Now it's time to move on to Zinno to see how those questions translate across to Pokemon's fourth generation. Alright, after winning the Evergrand Conference and returning to Kanto, Ash heads to spend some time in Pewter City with Brock. They are mainly there to ensure that the gym isn't closed due to Flint's negligence. This Flint, not that Flint. Once Brock hands the leadership of the gym over to his brother Forrest, he and Ash board a ship for Sinnoh. The only Pokemon accompanying Ash is his Blastoise, and Brock's only got Psyduck. As a result, our Sinnoh adventure begins very differently to the original timeline. Along with Pikachu, Ash's Apom sneaks aboard the ship to Sinnoh, but without those two or Team Rocket, there's no kidnapping to get things started. So, we are free to head straight to Professor Rowan's lab where Ash and Brock meet Dawn. Nothing major changes for her just yet, she still selects Piplup as her starter before joining Ash and Brock on the road to Jubilife City. It is worth noting that without Pikachu, we do have another surviving bicycle for our timeline. With all of the missing elements though, there's no Starly encounter on Route 202. Instead, it's the electric type Shinx that Ash makes his first Sinnoh capture. Further down the road, Ash, Brock, and Dawn cross paths with Paul, who asks for a 3-on-3 three -three battle after seeing Blastoise. As Ash's team is currently made up of just two, he's forced to decline, so naturally, Paul calls him pathetic and moves on. They return to Rowan's lab to pick up a package from Ash's mom, and after unpacking a new outfit and backpack, our trio hit the road once more. In the original timeline, Paul returns to ask for another battle with Ash, but without Pikachu and Team Rocket, there's no intrigue on his part, so we can skip that too. Okay, next up... Oh my god, why is this like half a page in my notes? It's not important at all. Everyone meets Nando, both Ash and Dawn battle him, this helps him decide to compete in both the gym challenge and contest, and Ash also registers for the Sinnoh Pokemon League. Yet that literally didn't even change from the original timeline. The next part does though. Without Team Rocket present in Sinnoh, Ash never meets Turtwig, so no grass starter for him. Another meeting with Paul leads to a one-on-one -on -one battle between Chimchar and Shinx. Ash is unimpressed with Paul's aggressive trainer style, but it proves effective as the Firestarter picks up the win. Again though, the lack of Jesse, James, and Meowth knocks us way off course. As they don't interfere here, there's no encounter with a herd of Startler, and Paul never finds or catches his Ursa Ring. Before leaving though, he does tell Ash that he'll need three Pokemon if he intends to take on the Orberg Gym Leader, so Ash has something to do. I feel like you're going to get sick of hearing this, but the lack of Team Rocket has thrown another rather insignificant spanner in the works. Without their fake gym, Brock never catches Krogunk, which is simply terrible news for the women of Sinnoh. Potatoes. Boil them, mash them, stick them in a stew. Sorry, I just needed to make that to get it out of my head. Just outside Jubilife City, Ash and Dawn are keen to catch a Baneri who seems drawn to Shinx. They decide to settle it with a race which Ash wins, earning the opportunity to catch the normal type. After a battle with Blastoise, Ash succeeds in adding Baneri to his team, which really confuses things, but that's more of an issue for me than you, so you don't really need to worry about it. Once our trio reach Jubilife City, both Ash and Dawn enter the Pokemon contest there, as it's clearly piqued Baneri's interest. Neither of them manage to earn a ribbon though, as a girl they met earlier named Zoe picks up the win. After that, we're free to skip ahead to Orberg City, where Ash's first Sinnoh gym battle will take place. Once they locate the local gym leader, Rourke, they learn that Paul's first in line for a gym battle. Ash's newest rival doesn't care who watches on, so the trio get to see Paul in action. Against Rourke, Paul chooses the trio of Azumarill, Elekid, and Chimchar, but it doesn't go to plan early on. Even though it has the type advantage, Azumarill is knocked out by Rourke's Geodude. After Elekid evens things up, Paul switches in Chimchar against Onyx. The Firestarter overcomes the odds to get the win, leaving the Orberg gym leader with only his Cranidos. Paul then pushes Chimchar to its limit, hoping to activate its ability, Blaze. That plan does seem to be working as Chimchar begins glowing bright red, but in spite of striking with Flame Wheel, Cranidos knocks it out before falling. It all comes down to Paul's Elekid, and thanks to a well-placed Brick Break, that's just enough. Even though Paul has triumphed and earned the Coal Badge, his strategy doesn't impress Ash, who once again feels he's pushed his Pokemon too hard. Wanting to prove a point, Ash asks Paul to stay around to watch his face off with Rourke. After some persuasion, he agrees to hang around for a day to see what Ash can do. That night in the Pokemon Center, Ash, Brock, and Dawn see a kid thanking Paul for gifting him a Zoomerill, which further angers Ash. It's clear that any Pokemon who doesn't reach Paul's extremely high exacting standards is cast aside without any care. 
More determined than ever, Ash arrives at the gym the next day, keen to show Paul that ruthlessness isn't the most important characteristic for a Pokemon trainer. With everything to prove to his rival, Ash decides to lead off with his Blastoise as Rourke calls on Cranidos. As disciplined as Rourke's ace is, the type disadvantage is too much to overcome. With precise blasts of Hydro Pump and calculated dig attacks, Blastoise takes down Cranidos without taking too many hits. When Onyx comes out for the Orberg gym leader, Ash feels a little bit of relief swapping Blastoise for Shinx. As always, Ash is determined to not become too reliant on his starter, so he knows allowing his new Pokemon to develop will be key. Rourke starts by setting up Stealth Rock as Ash calls for a tackle. Onyx barely notices the hit from Shinx as the gym leader instructs it to use Screech. The sound waves alone push the tiny electric type backwards before he can scramble back towards Onyx for another tackle. In close now and unable to avoid a hit, Shinx is crushed by a double edge which, thanks to Rockhead, doesn't even injure Onyx. Baneri comes out next for Ash and is injured on entry by the Stealth Rock before firing off an Ice Beam which shocks Rourke. It clips Onyx who's knocked back but counters with another crashing double edge. Baneri almost succeeds in dodging Onyx's attack but is grazed by the hit leaving it seriously weak. Recovering quickly, Baneri connects directly with a second Ice Beam, knocking out Onyx to leave Rourke with only one. Geodude's up last, and with Baneri struggling, it doesn't take long for Hidden Power to tie things up with only Blastoise left for Ash. The water type didn't sustain much damage against Cranidos though, so Geodude really has no chance. Hydro Pump finishes off the quad weak armed rock, earning Ash the coal badge at the first time of asking. In the original timeline, he failed on his first go, but he didn't have Blastoise. Paul remains unconvinced by Ash, but is quietly impressed by Blastoise's power. The two go their separate ways, both leaving Orberg City, with Ash heading to Floroma Town with Brock and Dawn. Despite leaving Orberg City early, as Dawn's training in preparation for her next contest, she still meets and catches Pachirisu. That's really the only thing worth covering before we make it to Floroma Town, so let's jump into the Floroma Pokemon contest. This was a pretty easy one to figure out. Dawn only uses Pachirisu and Piplup during the contest, so the result remains the same. As she won her first contest here in the original timeline, that carries over so Dawn's off the mark on her road to the Sino Grand Festival. Between Floroma Town and Eterna Forest, Ash and Dawn have a double battle with the champ twins Ryan and Brian. Shinx and Piplup seem to be doing okay against their Quillava and Croconore, but some cross wires between Ash and Dawn lead to their downfall. After a post-loss argument, they settle things and ask for a rematch which they win after Shinx evolves into Luxio. The trio then continue onwards to Eterna Forest where they all meet the next gym leader, Gardenia. Without Turtwig, there's no battle between her and Ash, so let's move on. The next thing worth covering in the original timeline is the Dress Up Contest, which Brock won with his Krogunk. That's where he originally won his Pokemon Egg that hatched Hapini. Now, he doesn't have Krogunk, and as Ash doesn't have Pikachu, I think that Hapini Egg is just going to some random trainer, so congratulations. Anyway, between Eterna Forest and Eterna City, Dawn fishes a Weasel who manages to best Piplup, Ash's Luxio, and Zoe's Glamiao. Eventually, Dawn succeeds in catching the water type though, so she's taken her team to three. That's no different from the original timeline, nor is her battle with Lucian, so let's jump forward to the Eterna City gym battle. The face-off with Gardenia sees Blastoise, Luxio, and Baneri taking on Cherubi, Turtwig, and Roserade. It's another gym where Luxio isn't terribly useful, but at least Tackle offers something this time around. Baneri's Ice Beam and Blastoise's Ice Punch end up being just enough to get Ash over the line here, but it's another close one. Only Blastoise is left standing when the dust settles, so Ash knows that he needs to catch some new Pokemon before the next gym. Okay, there's some Paul stuff, and then some Gary stuff, hey Gary, and finally Mira uses her Abra to teleport everyone to Heart Home City. Everyone being Ash, Dawn, and Brock, not Paul and Gary. Their adventures are unrelated. The local gym leader isn't there, so instead our trio head for the Pokemon contest, which doesn't change, really. Dawn does advance one stage further without Jesse around, but Nando still wins, so no second ribbon for now. After the loss, she decides to enter the Heart Home Tag Battle Tournament along with Ash and Brock. The pairings don't actually change as they group Dawn and Conway, Brock and Holly, and Ash and Paul. The opening round doesn't change much either. Brock is forced to use Psyduck instead of Sudowoodo, and Ash swaps Pikachu for Blastoise, but other than that, we're following the original timeline fairly closely. All three pairs advance, and even though Ash and Paul's teamwork is abysmal, the power of Blastoise and Chimchar help them through. Our trio come across Paul training that night, and once again, he's pushing Chimchar seemingly past its limit. Ash, Brock, and Dawn are horrified, with Ash going so far as to take Chimchar off of Paul to bring to the Pokemon Center. In the next round the following day, Dawn and Conway advance, as do Brock and Holly, but there are further problems for Ash and Paul. Against Nurse Joy's insistence, Paul checks Chimchar out of the Pokemon Center to use him in the second round. 
Ash selects Baneri but feels obliged to protect the injured Firestarter and it's simply too much. Paul ultimately stops giving commands to Chimchar, forcing Ash to do all of the work. Metagross and Zangus take down Baneri and Chimchar, knocking Ash and Paul out of the tag battle tournament. Look, I know what you're thinking. Paul is asshole. Why Ash hate? And simply, it's because Paul is bastard, man. After the loss, he decides to release Chimchar right in front of Ash, Brock, and Dawn. With everything they've been through over the last couple of days, though, Ash offers Chimchar a place on his team. There's some hesitation from the traumatized starter Pokemon, but in the end, it accepts his offer, taking Ash's team to four. Alright, let's finish off this tournament. Brock and Holly fall in the semi-finals to the Metagross Angus team, but Dawn and Conway progress, winning the final with Weasel and Heracross. As a result, Dawn and Conway each win a Soothe Bell, so that's nice. Ash and the others then decide to move on to Veilstone City, as the Heart Home Gym Leader is still absent. To test their levels, Ash and Dawn have a practice battle between Luxio and Weasel, which the Electric type narrowly wins with Spark. They decide to have a rematch with different Pokemon, where Dawn's Piplop defeats Chimchar, which elicits a worrying reaction. Chimchar seems to be expecting a scolding, but Ash congratulates it on a strong showing, which only leaves it confused. So that's not great. Anyway, a few days later, a little closer to Veilstone, Ash and Dawn are continuing their training. Baneri and Chimchar are having a practice battle, while Dawn has a contest battle against Zoe using her Buizel. Baneri can't keep its eyes off of the contest battle while Buizel is distracted by Ash. Noticing this, Zoe suggests that the two could trade their Pokemon. Unsure, they decide to test the waters first. Ash will use Buizel in a battle against Brock Psyduck, while Dawn tries a contest battle against Zoe with Baneri. It all seems to be a good fit, so they make the trade. There we go, Ash has got Buizel and Dawn's got Baneri. Um, then there's this. Isis, what a lovely name. Huh? Cool. Next up, we've got the Salacion Town Pokemon contest, which is changing quite drastically. In the original timeline, Dawn fails to clear the performance stage of the contest with her newly acquired and evolved Ambipom. This time around, she's using her Baneri though, and things go much better. In fact, with the added boost from the Soothe Bell she won in Heart Home City, Baneri evolves into Low Punny during the battle phase, helping Dawn on her way to the win. That takes her ribbon total to two and nudges her one step closer to the Sinnoh Grand Festival. In a nameless city between Salacion Town and Veilstone City, Ashbrock and Dawn help Nurse Joy and Officer Jenny rid the area of Gligar and Gliscor. Paul is also in town, attempting to catch the Gliscor, but we're switching things up from the original timeline again. Without Team Rocket around, the original plan succeeds and the Gligar and Gliscor are blown back to the forest. Determined to capture the leader of the pack, Paul heads off in the direction of the forest while our trio continue on the road to Veilstone City. In the original timeline, Ash caught one of the Gligar, but it doesn't take him long to catch a ground type in the alternate timeline. In what is the equivalent of the very next episode, Ash adds Hippopotas to his team so he's finally got a Pokemon that will travel around on his head and or shoulders. With all of that out of the way, we finally made it to Veilstone City, and thanks to Paul hunting Gliscor, Ash and friends beat him there. That means Ash will be battling Malian before Paul, so her confidence isn't completely shot, although she is somewhat lacking. We also don't get any meeting between our trio and Paul's brother Reggie, or any battle between Malian and Dawn. As he's finally got enough Pokemon to challenge Jim without Blastoise, Ash decides to battle Malian with Buizel, Luxio, and Chimchar. The loss to Paul and accompanying insults were the last straw for Malian, but things weren't exactly going swimmingly before that. During the battle, Buizel uses Water Pulse for the first time, Luxio cancels out a Metatype Meditate with Roar, and everything comes to a close with Chimchar activating Blaze against Lucario. It's completely uncontrolled, and after Malian's defeated, Ash has to grab the Raging Fire-type, badly injuring himself while waiting for Chimchar to calm down. Hardly a textbook win, but Ash earns the Cobble Badge regardless, so let's move on. Ash and co set their sights on Pastoria City next, but on their way there, they stop in at Lake Valor for the Wallace Cup. They get a call from May, who's travelling over from Joso to compete in the famous tournament. When she arrives at Lake Valor, she lets them know that after a top 4 finish in the Kanto Grand Festival, she went on to Johto where she's earned 3 ribbons so far. The whole Wallace Cup plays out pretty similarly to the original timeline, honestly. The whole thing comes to a close with Dawn facing off against May, and the Sinnoh native picks up the win, earning her third contest ribbon. That's all we get from May, who returns to Johto after her loss, so let's get back on the road to Pastoria City. Ash and Paul cross paths again in battle, but it ends in a stalemate. Paul calls it off when Chimchar's blaze activates, and it fails to keep things under control yet again. This leaves Ash injured once more as he tries to calm Chimchar down, but it does at least return to normal faster than last time. After being characteristically unimpressed, Paul decides to leave. With that battle out of the way, we can move on to the Pastoria Gym, where Ash takes on Crasher Wake. As Chimchar and Hippopotas aren't great tight matchups against the Water-type Gym Leader, Ash helps to bring Blastoise back into the fold for a gym battle. 
Joining him will be Luxio and Weasel, which makes for a pretty strong lineup. Luxio starts things against Gyarados, but even with the quad effect of electro type attacks, it's a close matchup. Although Gyarados has taken to his limit, he manages to earn the first win of the match with Dragon Rage to hand wake the lead. Blastoise doesn't take long to finish off the weakened water type with an ice punch though, so the Pistoria gym leader calls on Quagsire next. An ice punch is countered by a sludge bomb which knocks Blastoise backwards, but he finds his feet to fire a hydro pump straight at Quagsire. After some further back and forth, Blastoise picks off the partial ground type to leave Crasher Wake with only his ace. Floatzel enters the battle last and prepares to attack with Razor Wind, which allows Blastoise to land an Ice Punch. The close proximity means Floatzel has no problem connecting with Razor Wind to leave Blastoise on the cusp of fainting. An Ice Punch and Ice Fang land simultaneously, which further injures Floatzel, but after battling three consecutive Pokemon, it's more than Blastoise can take. Ash returns Blastoise to his Pokeball and sends out Weasel to take on its evolved form. The damage done by Blastoise gives Weasel a big head start and it's just about able to take advantage. A sonic boom from Weasel takes down Floatzel to give Ash the win, earning him the Fen Badge. After Pistoria City, our trio head for Heart Home, where Ash's next gym battle will take place. While walking through a forest on the way there, they're forced to stop in at Mr. Backlot's mansion to avoid a storm. A wild swine up also shows up in search of puffins, and long story short, Dawn ends up catching the furry ice pig? That takes Dawn's team to four, I think? Anyway, when they reach Heart Home City, they learn that the gym leader is somehow still not there. So let's just move on to Celestic Town where Dawn's next contest will take place. Ironically, it's on the way there that they meet Fantina. The absentee gym leader agrees to take on Ash in an unofficial battle. After her Drifloon puts both Weasel and Jim Jar to sleep with Hypnosis, Luxio comes out last. It gets close enough to attack with Spark, but rather than giving Ash an advantage, that just sets Drifloon's evolution in motion. As a Drift Blim, the increased speed allows another Hypnosis to connect, and with that, Ash forfeits. At least he knows what to expect when it finally comes time for his official Heart Home Gym battle. Once they reach Celestic Town, Dawn enters the Pokemon contest and wins. It's a change of strategy as Dawn doesn't have Ambipom, but she wins regardless. That's ribbon number four, so she's now only one win away from qualifying for the Grand Festival. On the way back to Heart Home, the trio come across Paul once more, and he has a one-on-one -on -one battle with Ash. After Hippopotas enters the battle for Ash, Paul calls on Torterra because it seems like that's the sort of thing he'd do. In a shock to Paul, Hippopotas does manage to put Torterra to sleep with Yawn and then deal damage with Takedown. Ultimately, a Leaf Storm earns Torterra the win, but Hippopotas earns great praise from Ash, Brock, and Dawn. That's everything worth noting on the road back to Heart Home, so let's jump back into the city for like the 15th time. Somehow, Fantina still isn't ready, so we've got a battle between Ash and Barry to take care of before the gym. The face-off sees Blastoise, Chimchar, and Luxray taking on Staraptor, Roserade, and Empoleon. It ends after Luxio evolves into Luxray, defeating Empoleon with a Thunderfang. As Barry's essentially just a massive Paul fanboy, he puts the victory down to Luck and decides to watch Ash vs. Fantina to see more. So, the next day, after 19 years of attempting to set up a battle with her, Ash finally gets ready for his Heart Home City gym battle against Fantina. Ash selects the trio of Buizel, Chimchar, and Luxray to take on Gengar, Miss Magius, and Driftblim. Thankfully, after his first face-off with Fantina, Ash has developed a strategy to deal with Hypnosis. Buizel and Chimchar both use the Counter Shield technique, where they flail about while using Water Gun and Flamethrower respectively. This not only creates a wall to block Hypnosis, but it does twice the job with the attacks dealing damage at the same time. That strategy is enough to make it past Gengar and Miss Magius, so when Fantina sends out Driftblim, Ash still has two Pokemon standing. He calls on Luxray for the first time, and although there's no Counter Shield in play here, he does have a different plan for the Electric type. After attacking with Thunderfang, Luxray is put to sleep by Hypnosis, seemingly without any defense from Ash. Fantina believes she's back in control until Ash calls for Sleep Talk. He taught Luxray the move in anticipation of this battle, knowing Fantina would use Hypnosis. It allows Luxray to attack while it's asleep by randomly selecting one of the moves it already knows. The first use of Sleep Talk selects Bite, and it catches both Fantina and Driftblim off guard. The move lands, and from there it's fairly elementary. Before the end, Luxray is woken up, so it's fully aware of using the Thunderfang that takes down Driftblim to earn Ash the win. Watching on from the sidelines, Barry is frustrated but impressed by Ash's performance. After adding the Relic Badge to his case, Ash heads to Camelave City with Brock and Dawn. Now, you'll be shocked to hear this, but yet another gym leader is missing in action. Do any of the Sinnoh gym leaders actually do their job? They seem shockingly lax in their duties. It's genuinely surprising that anyone can actually qualify for the Lily of the Valley Conference with so many of Sinnoh's gym leaders abandoning their posts so often. 
We can skip ahead to Byron's return to the gym though, because there's not much else worth covering. Once again, Chimchar and Buizel get the call, but this time around, Hippopotas will be taking up the third slot. Ash remains keen to develop his entire party rather than letting Blastoise do all the hard work. The battle begins with Chimchar facing off against Byron's Bronzong, and this plays out just like the anime. It's a tough battle, but Chimchar pulls through to pick up the first win of the match. When Byron's Steelix comes out, Ash recalls Chimchar and sends out Buizel. This face-off doesn't go so well. Constantly keeping Buizel away with Screech, Steelix is eventually able to tie up the match with a powerful Iron Tail. Chimchar has recovered just enough to return to battle and defeat Steelix, but after that one, it's got almost nothing left. When Bastiodon comes in for Byron, Ash recalls Chimchar once more and sends out Hippopotas. Although the ground type does manage to strike with a quad effective dig, Iron Defense keeps Bastiodon healthy. When Flamethrower knocks out Hippopotas, Ash is left with only his Chimchar. The Fire Star is weak from its previous exploits, and when it's hit by a flash cannon, Blaze activates and Chimchar begins to evolve. As a Monferno, the Fire Monkey now has access to Mach Punch, but while Blaze is in effect, Ash calls for Flame Wheel. Although it's not in complete control, Monferno is able to knock out Bastiodon while Blaze is active without losing its cool entirely. That's definite progress, and with the Mind Badge in hand, Ash can now leave Canalave City. The next stop worthy of mentioning is in Chocovine Town, where Dawn's competing in another contest. It's mostly just randoms entering, and the only change from the original timeline is Dawn's got low punny instead of Baneri. As a result, she's still crowned the winner, meaning Dawn has officially earned her fifth ribbon. That qualifies her for the Sinnoh Grand Festival like 50 episodes before she did in the original timeline, so good work Dawn. Her journey has been transformed so much more than Maze was in Hoenn. After finishing up in Chocovine Town, Ash, Brock, and Dawn head for Snowpoint City where the next gym is located. On the way there, they cross paths with a lonely Snover who just wants to play pranks and make friends. It proves powerful in the few pranks it pulls, so Ash decides to catch the Frost Tree Pokemon taking his team to six. Yeah, it's about time. Before reaching Snowpoint City, we also get the double evolution of Dawn's Swinub. It evolves later than the original timeline because of the lack of Team Rocket, but it learns Ancient Power quickly, so the second evolution happens almost instantly. As Swinub got to witness Dawn in action at the Chocovine Pokemon contest, it doesn't become disobedient as a Mamoswine, and yeah, that's it. We've made it to Snowpoint City. For some reason, unlike every other gym leader in Sinnoh, Candace has decided to use a team of four Pokemon instead of three. Although thinking about it, she's also gone against type by actually being at her gym. Her team of Sneasel, Medicham, Snover, and Abomasnow take on Ash's quartet of Hippopotas, Monferno, Luxray, and Snover. In the gym battle, Ash takes a page out of Fantina's book and makes ample use of Hippopotas' yawn and Snover's grass whistle. That along with Monferno's fire type attacks actually make the battle a fairly easy one for Ash. As he leaves the gym with the Icicle Badge, Paul rocks up announcing his intent to challenge Candace next. Before that battle can go ahead, Candace's Pokemon need treatment, so she offers to take on Paul the next day instead. Honestly, I feel like Candace doesn't understand what being a Sinnoh gym leader is all about. She's far too available. After finishing one battle, she should have travelled to Kanto to learn how to juggle or something. Anyway, while everyone's hanging out at the Pokemon Center, Reggie shows up and Ash, Brock, and Dawn are introduced to him. While they're all talking, the Battle Pyramid flies overhead, which only Reggie and Paul recognise. Of course, in this timeline, Ash never took on Brandon, so it's completely new to him. Reggie drives everyone over to the Battle Pyramid's landing spot, and we learn that he challenged Brandon and lost, which ultimately led to him quitting battling. It was this face-off that inspired Paul's trainer style, so as soon as Brandon emerges from the pyramid, he challenges him to a battle. Brandon accepts, and then proceeds to just absolutely decimate him. If it weren't so sad, it would be quite funny. In the full battle, Paul fails to register a single KO, which is, if we're honest, quite embarrassing. Reggie suggests that both Ash and Paul would grow from having a 6-on-6 six -six battle due to their conflicting styles, so they agree to face off at Lake Acuity in a few days' time. We can jump straight ahead to that point once Paul's won his Icicle Badge and we're ready to go with the full battle. Ash gets things started with Buizel, but when Paul calls on Tartara, Ash makes an immediate switch out to Snover. Although it's a valiant effort with the Ice-type landing a quad effective Powder Snow, Paul and Torterra have learned from their mistakes against Hippopotas' yawn. Snover's Grass Whistle fails, and ultimately a Stone Edge hands Paul the first win of the match. Ash calls on his Monferno next, who's determined to prove a point against Paul and goes all out to defeat the weakened Torterra. A Flamethrower knocks out Paul's starter to level up the match, so he sends in Electabuzz next, which prompts a change from Ash too. Hippopotas comes out third and goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Electabuzz, but it's a bridge too far for the inexperienced ground type. Dig does connect once, but Electabuzz controls the whole face-off, finishing things with a brick break to hand Paul back the lead. Ash then decides to send Monferno back into battle, but this time it's Paul who switches out. 
Gliscor joins the battle and although it lands an X-Scissor, its attempted guillotine fails, allowing Monferno to hit the flyer with Flamethrower for another KO. The evolved Firestarter is running on fumes at this point, so when Magmortar enters on Paul's side, Ash recalls Monferno to send out Weasel. It's a close fought battle, but after Will-O-Wisp burns Weasel, a flamethrower earns Magmortar the win, handing the lead back to Paul once again. Ash finally sends out Blastoise, who has no trouble taking down Magmortar, who's badly injured from its clash with Weasel. A single Hydro Pump eliminates Paul's fire type to take the battle into a 3 on 3. Electabuzz needs more time to recover, so Paul calls on Weavile, whose speed should be sufficient to trouble Blastoise. It does cause some big problems, charging up with a sword stance before striking with Metal Claw. Both Pokemon land a series of attacks before Dig finishes things to leave Paul with only two. Paul's penultimate Pokemon is Haunchcrow and it quickly levels up the match with Blastoise too injured to defend itself against a Dark Pulse. Luxray is the last Pokemon to join the battle and although Haunchcrow is able to deal some serious damage, a Spark takes down the Flying type to leave Paul in a one on two. Electabuzz returns to battle and sets up a light screen before ultimately taking down Luxray with a Brick Break. That leaves only Monferno. Electabuzz and Monferno face off in the center of the battlefield and just start throwing. Brick breaks and mock punches land with neither Pokemon bothering to defend themselves. After a series of strikes, Electabuzz glows bright and evolves into Electivire, throwing a thunder punch that sends Monferno flying. The attack sends the fire monkey into a rage after which it evolves too. Even after the evolution, Infernape's emitting a fiery glow due to Blaze. With both Pokemon at their limit, Ash and Paul call for Flamethrower and Thunder respectively and the two attacks strike true. Infernape and Electivire stand across from one another, staring intensely until Electivire collapses, leaving Ash as the winner. Paul's furious, having not only lost the battle but seeing Ash get the best out of Infernape. The now fully evolved Firestarter had Blaze completely under control as it took down Electivire, so cracks seem to be forming in Paul's training theories. Reggie and Paul leave Lake Acuity as Brock and Dawn come over to congratulate Ash and Infernape on an incredible performance. After all that action, the trio head for Twinleaf Town next to attend the annual Twinleaf Festival. While there, Ash wins the Festival Battle Challenge which earns him the opportunity to battle Palmer, a member of the Sinnoh Battle Frontier and Barry's father. For the 101 battle, Palmer selects his Rhyperior and Ash chooses Buizel. The water type has quite effective attacks at its disposal but Palmer's Rhyperior is incredibly well trained. The final blow landed is a powerful Megahorn that tosses Buizel back to Ash's feet unconscious. Palmer is impressed regardless and suggests Ash head to Sunnyshore City next to take on the gym leader there. As Dawn has already earned her 5 ribbons, the trio don't head to Lilypad Town so she never wins her Cyndaquil egg in the nearby Johto Festival. The direct path to Sunnyshore City also means no Daybreak Town contest and thus no Gibble for Ash. That's all that needs covering on the way to Sunnyshore City so he can jump ahead to the end of an extremely long trip. When Ashbrock and Dawn arrive at the gym, they learn that Volkner's absent, of course, and giving out badges for free. After such a long journey, Ash is unwilling to leave without a battle, so goes to meet Volkner. It takes an intense battle between Ash and Flint to reignite Volkner's passion, but after watching them face off, he accepts Ash's challenge. Unlike the original timeline, Team Rocket aren't there to interfere with Sunny Shore Tower, so Ash's gym battle with Volkner isn't interrupted. Even though it plays out without any interference, Ash's trio of Infernape, Luxray and Hippopotas lose against Volkner's team of Electivire, Jolteon and Luxray. Ash heads off to prepare for a rematch and then returns to the Sunny Shore Gym a few days later. The teams are unchanged from their first encounter, but this time Ash knows what to expect from Volkner. The biggest change comes when Hippopotas evolves during its battle with Electivire and earns the win with an Earthquake as Hippowdon. Ash defeats Volkner in his final Sinnoh Gym battle, adding the beacon badge to his case and qualifying him for the Lily of the Valley Conference. Alright, before that we've got to take care of the Sinnoh Grand Festival. On the way to the Valor Lakefront to compete, our trio arrive in Arrowroot Town where they meet Dawn's royal doppelganger, Princess Saliva. Nope, that's a typo, Princess Salvia. She switches places with Dawn so Lindsay Lohan can convince Dennis Quay to break up with his girlfriend. Unfortunately, Dawn makes for a poor princess, so even though Salvia has fun as the pauper S. Potpourri? Potpourri? Oh god, I've lost track of this. It all ends with Salvia gifting her Togekiss to Dawn so it can compete in contests rather than living a boring royal life. Okay, that's all for the trip to the Valor Lakefront, let's get into the Sinnoh Grand Festival. Although she can't pull off her fire and ice combos without Cyndaquil, Dawn still progresses past the performance stage with the duo of Lopunny and Togekiss. Piplup and Pachirisu earn her a victory against Ursula, and Mamoswine and Lopunny get her through the semi-final. She still uses Piplup and Togekiss in the final though, so Zoe still beats her with Gallade and Glamiao. Huh? I thought she was gonna win that. I think this makes the most sense though. That was pretty pointless. Let's move on. Oh my god, we're so far into this video already. Let's try to keep things fairly brief during the Lily of the Valley conference. 
Ash, Paul, Barry, Nando and Conway all sign up to compete and as he's trying to emulate his Evergrand Conference victory, Ash decides to only use his Sinnoh team. Okay, this one's not too surprising, Ash defeats Nando in the first round with Infernapes, Nova and Luxray. Roserade, Armaldo and Cricketoon put up a decent fight but it's a fairly easy win for Ash in the end. Paul and Conway both advance too but Barry falls to Misty. Yes, she is here too. After failing to take down Brandon on multiple attempts, she headed for Sinnoh late so never crossed paths with Ash and Co. The second round isn't a roadblock for anyone. Hippowdon, Blastoise and Buizel help Ash advance while Paul, Conway and Misty also pick up wins. The round of 16 then throws everyone together with Ash drawing Conway and Paul drawing Misty. The first matchup of the round sees Paul facing Misty so Ash gets to watch two of his greatest rivals facing off. The battle pits Paul's Electivire, Torterra and East Sea Gastrodon against Misty's Gardo, Starmie and West Sea Gastrodon. It's a sadly dominant performance from Paul who wins without losing a Pokemon to Misty's dismay. It also comes as a shock to Ash and Brock who know how strong Misty can be from their previous encounters. It does at least help refocus Ash who knows he'll need to be on top of his game to take down Conway. He selects the trio of Luxray, Infernape and Blastoise as Conway calls on Shuckle, Licky Licky and Dusk Noir. Conway relies on well thought out plans but they're not as clever as he thinks. After Shuckle uses Power Trick, a Hydro Pump from Blastoise absolutely annihilates it. Licky Licky does succeed in knocking off Blastoise with a Thunderbolt but it's knocked out simultaneously by a Hydro Pump. Dust Noir's outlast for Conway and uses Trick Room which does help it defeat Luxray but Infernape's too much. Flare Blitz finishes off Dust Noir, handing Ash the win and earning him a spot in the quarterfinal where he's drawn against… Paul. Do you see why I had to go through all of that quickly? It was like two pages of notes but seriously, you all knew we were eventually getting back to Ash vs Paul. So let's get into it. Unlike the original timeline, Paul doesn't need to sacrifice some Pokemon to figure out Ash's strategy. He's watched his first few battles and knows the exact team he'll be using. As a result, Paul's able to handpick the perfect six Pokemon to battle against Ash's team from Lake Acuity. The battle begins with Buizel facing off against Paul's Drapion. The poison type lays down toxic spikes and then slowly begins to pick apart Buizel. Drapion consistently blocks any attempted attacks while landing moves over and over. A pin missile ends up knocking out Weasel to give Paul an early lead. Ash sends out Hapout on second and the toxic spikes instantly poison it. Before Ash can even call for a super effective move, Paul recalls Drapion and throws out his second Pokemon, Torterra. The spiky tree turtle thing is very familiar with Hapout on and has counters ready for everything it can do. It still takes a couple of hits, but ultimately a Frenzy Plant eliminates Ash's second Pokemon to stretch Paul's advantage to two. While the Grass type is recharging, Infernape enters the battle and attacks with Flamethrower, but it can't avoid the poisoning either. Torterra is badly damaged, but before Infernape can attack again, Paul switches out to Gastrodon. The damage being inflicted by Toxic Spikes is causing too much havoc for Ash's team, so his first task is getting rid of those. Infernape digs down and executes an Underground Flare Blitz that burns off the Toxic Spikes and deals a bit of damage to Gastrodon. The Sea Slug is a terrible matchup for Infernape though, dealing damage with Water Pulse and Muddy Water while the Fire Monkey fails to cause any problems. Before he loses Infernape, Ash decides to switch out to Blastoise who's really his best remaining option. His ever-reliable starter doesn't have too much to worry about against Gastrodon, earning Ash his first win of the match with a Hydro Pump. Drapion returns to battle next and sets up another layer of Toxic Spikes on Ash's side of the field. It goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Blastoise and holds out for as long as possible but it's ultimately knocked out by a powerful dig. After tough fought wins against Gastrodon and Drapion, Blastoise isn't in great shape when Paul's Torterra rejoins the battle. Ash's starter stands across the battlefield from Paul's and after a call for Ice Punch begins charging toward it. Frenzy Plant rises from the earth though, catching Blastoise and throwing it backwards. By the time Blastoise lands on the layer of toxic spikes, it's already unconscious. Ash doesn't have time to worry about going behind once more though, so sends Snova out for the first time. Torterra is forced to recharge after the Frenzy Plant which gives Snova a free opportunity to attack with Powder Snow. After all the damage sustained against Hippowdon and Infernape, the quad effective attacks more than Torterra can take. Paul's starter faints too, so once again we're all tied up. Magmortar enters the battle fourth for Paul and with Snow for Poison and the benefit of fire type moves it doesn't take too long to score the knockout. Luxray is next in line and thanks to the toxic spikes it's poisoned on entry too. The back and forth battle culminates with Thunderfang and Fire Punch landing simultaneously for a double knockout. That leaves Ash with only one. Infernape and Frostlass replace their faint teammates and get right to work. Paul calls for Hail while Ash instructs Infernape to use Flamethrower. The Fiery Blast connects with Frostlass but once the Hail starts coming down she seems to disappear thanks to Snow Cloak. After that Infernape can't seem to hit with anything while Frostlass succeeds in landing a couple of Ice Beams, the second of which freezes the Fire type. 
As the hail stops, Ash calls for a flare blitz which defrosts Infernape and destroys the now visible Frostlass. The recoil takes Infernape off its feet and activates Blaze, but the Firestarter can barely stand. Paul calls on Electivire last and as the Electric type enters, Infernape struggles to its feet. Ash calls for a flamethrower while Paul counters with Protect and even that much effort causes Infernape to collapse again. As Paul calls for Thunder, Ash shouts for Infernape to dodge but the attack connects, further weakening it. Paul is shocked to see Infernape clambering back to its feet but doesn't let up, calling for a Thunder Punch. Ash calls for Flare Blitz and the two Pokemon charge to center field. Both attacks land but it was only ever going to end one way. Infernape is knocked out by the force of the hit combined with the recoil damage. The power of Flare Blitz does take Electivire to a knee but it's just about still able to battle meaning Paul has defeated Ash and advanced to the semi-final. As the two rivals recall their Pokemon they come together and Paul thanks Ash for a great battle. He admits that only by adapting his training strategy after Lake Acuity has he been able to improve so much. And that's where Ash's Sinnoh journey comes to a close. Of course, he stays around for the end of the Lily of the Valley Conference, but the original timeline outcome doesn't change. Paul's forced to field a weakened team against Tobias and he fails to even knock out Darkrai. So Tobias' Latios, Magikarp, Sunker, and Caterpie and Feebas never even get a chance to battle. Of course, Tobias also eases through the final, which isn't a particularly satisfying ending, but that's really the only realistic outcome when you create a character like Tobias. After the conference ends, Ash and Brock decide to head back to Twinleaf Town with Dawn. On the ferry there, Brock's tasked with Karen for a sick Pokemon, which helps him realise that he wants to pursue becoming a Pokemon doctor. That means he'll be staying in Pewter City to study when he returns to Kanto, so there's no way for him to travel with Ash on the next leg of his journey. On top of that, Dawn decides to stay in Sinnoh, meaning Ash will be going it alone on his next adventure. Whatever that happens to be, let's just hope it's not this damn long because, oh my god, this took about seven years to make. There are lessons for Ash to learn from his travels through Sinnoh, but they'll probably be easier to explore in the next installment. Until then, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.